I'm the Director of Strategic Planning for the Canadian Association of Wound Care. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webcast on Wound Mapping, a Guide to Targeted Debridement and Wound Healing Courtesy of Moleculite. To provide today's overview, we have Dr. Stefan Landis, who's a consulting internist wound physician within the Department of Hospital Medicine and Ambulatory Wound Clinic at the Guelph Hospital CCAC, and he will provide more details about his background. We look forward to hearing your questions after the formal presentation portion of the webcast, but I would encourage you to submit your questions throughout the webcast. For now, I would like to hand the presentation over to Dr. Stefan Landis. Stefan. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Doug. <clears throat> and greetings to all registrants and uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, as Doug said, um, I'm a hospitalist uh, internist uh, practicing in infectious diseases and uh, physician consultant in wound care at the uh, Guelph General Hospital, which is a community hospital in the Waterloo Wellington region of Ontario. And I, I come uh, to this today with uh, about 20 years of uh, wound management experiences. <clears throat> So uh, I'd like to make several acknowledgments uh, here to those agencies uh, which are part of this uh, presentation, which uh, uh, you can see on this slide. And um, I'd also like to uh, uh, initially start with uh, several disclosures uh, regarding this presentation that uh, I have uh, some previous speakers' fees and all photos presented here are taken uh, with the uh, patient's express consent. <clears throat> so I'd like to uh, begin now by listing some of the objectives of this uh, talk. And uh, what I'd like to do is to introduce the concept of uh, wound bed mapping uh, to show how microbial autofluorescence can be easily incorporated into bedside wound evaluation and also to provide uh, some objective assessments uh, of wound infection and how the tool itself can be used for clinical decision making in real time. So firstly, what do we really mean by wound mapping? Well, this is a bedside assessment uh, technique uh, that images microbial distribution within and around a wound, linking it to patients' pain experiences and peri-wound temperature differences while tracking wound size over time. Uh, this assessment permits an objective, visual, and reproducible representation uh, from which better treatment decision-making can be made. <clears throat> now, I'd like to review the wound bed paradigm, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. This is the tool for how we think about wound care these days. And the acronym uh, DIME, or DIME, along with identifying and treating the cause, as well as uh, client and culture centered concerns, has produced a much more holistic approach to wound management. We see that uh, digital technologies developed over the last several years have brought new tools uh, to our bedside for wound evaluation. And we're now at a point uh, where we can begin to incorporate these tools uh, into wound assessment and decision making. So if we uh, choose to do a, a quick Google search, we can see that there are really no shortage of wound care apps that allow documentation, wound visualization, and storage of clinical material. However, which ones are the most useful? Which ones integrate the process of assessment and management directly at the bedside? Here's another slide that I think uh, you are no doubt familiar with. <clears throat> we know that the presence of bacteria within a wound is a constant threat to wound healing. We accept the concepts of contamination, colonization, critical colonization, and infection, which are used to describe those stages of bacterial involvement within a wound. 
At this po point, I would say that to date, the term critical colonization has largely been looked upon as a conceptual term without any clear bedside clinical representation. <clears throat> We also recognize that biofilms are thought to play important roles as a resident wound structures uh, that allow microbes to survive within a wound. And you can see that each stage in progression going down that curve relates to, one, the level of microbial load, two, uh, the ability of the microbe to cause disease, and of course, three, the host's ability to resist. So how the host reacts to bacterial activity is also a very important determinant of how a wound heals. <clears throat> now here we can see an example of the observation that a 30% reduction in wound size at four weeks predicts healing at 12 weeks in diabetic and venous ulcers. This wound you can see has healed within a period of eight weeks. So that is good success. Accurate bedside assessments of wound infection have created much debate uh, within the wound care circles. And terms such as amount and character of exudate, presence of local edema, erythema, odor, increasing wound size and depth, uh, have been some of the terms patched together to identify deep compartment infection, local uh, wound infection, or critical colonization. As I said before, critical colonization has been referred to as a theoretical concept, which cannot be differentiated from colonization and is not quantifiable. However, is this really strictly true? <clears throat> we must remember that wound infection is a bedside diagnosis made in real time by a real clinician. However, he or she doesn't conjure up a clinical impression. The clinician integrates assessing the cause, visual analysis, sometimes checklists, personal experience, and sometimes just raw gut feeling into a case at hand. However, conclusions about wound compartment infection can differ among various observers who may use different tools or interpretations to arrive at a clinical answer. Now, having said all this, we can now ask, so what is microbial autofluorescence and why is it important in wound assessment and decision making? Well, autofluorescence is that natural emission of light, specifically by bacterial and biological structures within a wound when microbes are exposed to outside light of specific wavelengths. Now, the pattern of bacterial autofluorescence allows varying concentrations of bacteria in the wound uh, from intense to medium to sparse to be visualized and mapped to determine the degree of microbial load and where in the wound these bacteria are located. These bacteria are likely planktonic or active with a potential to cause deep compartment infection. <clears throat> and you can see when we compare a white light image here with an autofluorescence image, the uh, appearance of intense red autofluorescent uh, presence of bacteria, which uh, would not be predicted by simply looking at the white light image. So again, we see uh, pre- and post-debridement pictures. Success in debridement uh, depends upon technical skill and what the patient will tolerate with topical analgesia. I would just add here that uh, before any consideration of wound debridement is made, the first question uh, to ask is, of course, whether debridement is safe, uh, whether the wound is healable, 
and whether the patient is using blood thinners, which uh, can be sometimes a problem, as I'm sure many of you know. Autofluorescence images, as you can see here, can direct the clinician where and how to carry out sharp debridement. White light photos and autofluorescent images can compare what we normally cannot see during standard examination. Uh, there are actually few data in the literature that examine the efficacy of a sharp debridement procedure done at the bedside. There is an assumption that once debridement has been performed, that the wound has been freed of its microbial load. Now, how true is this? How successful are we at sharp debridement when we simply look at the images that we see at the bedside, really those images which are seen in white light photography here. When you look at the autofluorescent pictures, you can see that residual bacteria are present even after the procedure. I would call this post-debridement image a critically colonized wound or a wound of low-grade infection. Now, we uh, performed a short prospective pilot study at the Guelph uh, General Hospital and the uh, Guelph General uh, CCAC clinic, which is housed under the same roof, uh, using pre- and post-debridement autofluorescence of 60 wounds in 28 clinic patients <clears throat> with a range of underlying diagnoses. Interestingly, we reveal that even in expert hands, sharp surgical debridement removed less than half, or approximately 40 percent, of bacterial groups from the wounds as seen on post-debridement autofluorescent imaging here. Bacteria were still present in an asymmetric uh, distribution in the three-dimensional space of the wound. So uh, surface uh, uh, groups of bacteria may be more easily removed than those which lie in deeper uh, levels within that wound. So how does our debridement influence microbial distribution within the wound? Uh, are we going to remove offending bacteria, or are we going to upset that balance uh, that uh, hence uh, encourages bacteria to enter deeper structures and cause clinical infection through our debridement procedure? Are we reducing the degree of critical colonization and thereby reducing the risks of deep compartment infection? So the bedside handheld tool that uh, performs the autofluorescence function is a modified miniature iPad uh, that records white light images and emits a fluorescence uh, beam to be recorded in autofluorescent imaging. And you can see here uh, the unit itself. Uh, you can see the fluorescent beam, the uh, purple beam, which uh, uh, then provides uh, the coloring that is picked up in the autofluorescent imaging. There's no patient contact. There are no contra uh, contrast agents. And it's pretty simple to use. So our ob observations raise a variety of interesting questions, and I'd like to just uh, go through them. What is the role of targeted debridement on areas of bacterial growth? Do bacteria repopulate debrided areas? And how frequently should persistent bacterial sites be redebrided? Does this lead to faster healing if debridement is done more frequently? Who gets uh, systemic antibiotics, who should get them, or who should be treated with topical antiseptics only, and who does not require any antimicrobial dressings and could be managed with simpler dressings. How can patterns of autofluorescence be used to track and document clinical outcomes in an objective way? <clears throat> 
I'm going to comment again on each of these. So removing areas of microbial involvement reduces the overall microbial load. Bacteria, however, are present in a three-dimensional environment. So the results of post-debridement offer three possibilities. The wound post-debridement might be free of autofluorescence, or it may be unchanged, or it may even show more autofluorescence. And I would submit that unchanged or greater autofluorescence post-debridement suggests a clinical underestimation of the degree of critical colonization. And I'd like you to hold on to that thought as we go through. Without periodic uh, debridement, bacteria do repopulate. And in this case of a diabetic um, ulcer, Bacterial persistence is noted post-debridement, and these autofluorescent pictures are all post-debridement autofluorescent pictures taken over a several week period. More frequent debridement, say once weekly or every two weeks, likely pushes critical colonization in the direction of more rapid microbial load reduction. Although with pressure um, offloading, and local dressings, uh, a reduction in wound size can be achieved. And targeting the debridement to reduce uh, post-debridement autofluorescence is really desirable. So autofluorescence objectively shows patterns of low microbial load or critical colonization. And you can see that even over this period of time, the wound is getting smaller but uh, the persistence of bacteria around the edges is ongoing. So who should get systemic antibiotics? Well, we believe that wound mapping, when combined with other uh, objective uh, bedside techniques, can stratify and improve clinical decision-making. Here are two separate wounds in the same patient one on the left leg and one on the right. In addition to wound mapping, measuring and documenting peri-wound temperature is important. And a difference of at least three degrees Fahrenheit around the wound or when compared to a contralateral anatomical site suggests a deep compartment involvement. Uh, with a likelihood ratio probably of at least eight and uh, using an inexpensive thermal camera attached to an iPhone, a simple available device, precise readings of 0.1%, uh, 0 0.1 degree Fahrenheit uh, can be made and digitally documented. It is important to realize that deep compartment infections may start uh, with asymmetrical extensions from a wound edge which can be measured through autofluorescence. So measuring temperatures around the wound is also important. Interestingly enough, here we see a three degree temperature difference between both legs and this patient received a 10 day course of antibiotics because of that three degree temperature difference. Changes in pain perception as measured by just a simple question to the patient uh, such as, has your pain increased significantly recently? Or have you had to increase your pain medication? It can be very important. And um, uh, a change in pain pattern also has a high likelihood ratio, probably in excess of 15, for deep compartment infection. So these are two bedside evaluations in addition to wound mapping, which uh, can determine which patients require treatment with systemic agents for deep compartment infection and uh, which uh, ulcers may not. Diabetic patients uh, with probed bone likely all require systemic antibiotics and debridement, but only if deemed healable. All patients with uh, demonstrable autofluorescence will require dressings with some antiseptic capacity. 
So microbial wound cultures should be taken post-debridement, and uh, I would submit that one might have better results uh, by culturing the edges of persistent autofluorescence to best sample putative pathogens. Uh, in contradistinction to some of the uh, approaches that we have taken by sampling the center of the wound. So in summary, um, uh, increased temperature and pain indicate co deep compartment infection requiring systemic agents. Patients with less than three degree temperature differences or no change in pain pattern probably can be managed with topical antiseptic dressings alone. So wound mapping um, um, measure can be uh, used to measure responses to treatment. In this slide, uh, wound size, uh, area, and depth uh, dimensions, including probing to bone, are made by a novel iPhone software application. And here, uh, uh, these um, uh, measurements uh, quickly establish baseline and follow up wound depths and computed areas uh, to objectively record and document changes in depths of one millimeter up to one millimeter and areas less than 0.1 uh, centimeter squared. So here the patient required debridement and a course of uh, antibiotics uh, two weeks into the assessment and responded rapidly. And uh, uh, here we can see um, uh, improvement in size as evidenced by uh, uh, the uh, area involved, which uh, demonstrates that over a period of a month there was a 30 to 40 percent improvement. What I have not shown here uh, to uh, uh, lessen the degree of a busy slide is progressive uh, improvement in um, uh, autofluorescence as well. Now wounds with no evidence of microbial persistence or um, autofluorescence, that red te telltale uh, uh, coloring of edging, um, likely do not require frequent sharp debridement or even antimicrobial dressings. Um, so one might say here that there's very little evidence of uh, uh, low wound uh, involvement. And um, these likely could be managed, these types of wounds could be managed with appropriate moisture balance and the other holistic methods of w the wound bed paradigm. Uh, interestingly enough, this particular case was one uh, of a case of local trauma in a patient who was on immunosuppressives for rheumatoid arthritis and uh, the degree of immunosuppression likely uh, uh, did not produce much in the way of healing over this month's period. Now here, um, patterns of autofluorescence uh, can indicate bacterial activity in the wound. And uh, the host's ability to resolve the problem can be measured and documented by changing patterns of autofluorescence and wound sizing. Uh, interestingly enough, this was a patient who um, we followed uh, in clinic for approximately three years with no improvement in um, uh, the wounds. And uh, when we started to use uh, autofluorescence and more frequent debridement, um, this wound actually began to heal and we used some specific uh, antimicrobial uh, dressings as well. Uh, so uh, this uh, uh, was very surprising to us and most surprising to the patient. So um, I would say here that English language acronyms rarely translate well uh, on the international stage and the uses of bedside digital technologies now permit the mapping of wounds in terms of bacterial distributions. 
Specific wound temperature profiles and size measurements do not require complex recording and can easily be placed in a receptive electronic record for outcomes tracking if one has such receptive EMRs. This objective approach fits well into the wound bed paradigm. Uh, wound uh, mapping offers objective assessment, which is integrated at the bedside with simple diagnostic and decision-making technologies. The concept is currently being tested for validation and ease of use. And the most pleasant surprise is the high level of patient acceptance, where patients can follow their own real-time progress in clinic, seeing their wound size measurements and their own autofluorescence patterns. So in conclusion, I'd like to uh, state that uh, wound mapping using autofluorescence provides a more objective assessment of the wound, that monitored debridement is key to wound healing, individual wounds require specific stratification um, of uh, frequency of debridement and integrating wound mapping with peri-wound temperature recording, uh, pain evaluation and wound sizing offers an objective, simplified, reproducible template for more rational wound management and antimicrobial use. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Landis, for a very interesting and informative presentation. Um, before I hand, there's still some time to um, ask your questions and put them in, so please do. And before I hand over to our moderator to read the questions that we already have, I have one question for you, um, Dr. Landis. Um, how has the Moleculite device changed your practice? Well, um, that's an interesting question. I was uh, quite uncertain about it when I uh, first acquired it until I started to use it and uh, I actually carry it with me everywhere. It's always in my bag and I use it at every clinic and um, use it to assess wounds uh, uh, in that objective way uh, along with temperature and, um, uh, and, and wound measurement. So from a recording point of view, uh, I record um, all pictures that uh, I take and uh, and use it as a as a, not only for decision making but uh, for patient education and uh, patients uh, now because uh, they have uh, seen me use it come to uh, expect me to use it because they'd like to know what progress they're making so if you excuse the pun it's light and convenient <laughs> With that um, horrible joke, I'll hand over to our moderator who will um, ask the questions that have come in from our audience. Great. Thank you, Douglas. Our first question, does it take longer or more time to use the IX? Well, you know, there's a learning curve uh, to this uh, technology, and um, um, uh, I'm, I'm getting much quicker at it uh, uh, in terms of being able to uh, take pictures quickly and flip lights. Uh, so um, uh, the uh, the autofluorescence has to be taken in a dark room, and uh, so we have the uh, fortune to in our clinic to be able to turn lights off, and quite often the nurse is there to to help. So uh, it has not really been that uh, problematic uh, in, in terms of uh, of uh, uh, using the technology. It's the decision of how much to debride, which obviously takes some time, but that would be an issue even if I didn't have the device. Okay, our next question. I don't debride. How is the IX autofluorescence imaging useful to me? Well, I think that um, it, it depends who's asking the question because certainly from a nursing point of view, nursing in the community does not do sharp debridement, although debridement is an integral part of the wound bed paradigm. Um, I think what we don't really have a good feel for are the results of debridement using other forms of uh, non-surgical debridement. And that, that in itself would be a, um, a, a useful investigation. 
Um, I find that uh, because I have access to it, I use it frequently, and uh, and my results uh, tend to uh, um, be a little quicker. But uh, certainly, um, you know, uh, even post debridement, we would be using uh, dressings that might provide some autolytic debridement, uh, some antimicrobial activity, um, that sort of thing. Is the temperature of the wound bed as useful as the peri wound temp? Um, not really, because um, uh, one might find that uh, the wound bed itself may have uh, uh, a lower temperature uh, reading than the uh, the peri wound temperature. Um, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's it's a difficult um, uh, interpretation to make. I think that uh, where uh, wounds tend to generate infection um, uh, is within the tissue, uh, within the, the peri-wound tissue itself, with the extension of bacteria into, the, uh, into normal tissue. And the inflammatory response seems to be greater here. Um, we know, for instance, that uh, uh, bacteria such as streptococci can uh, migrate uh, into the peri wound temperature sometimes uh, in a very unidirectional way you know the, the prime example of that is lymphangitis where bacteria travel up uh, um, um, lymphatic channels and uh, those areas can uh, be quite inflamed so uh, I, I'm paying more attention now not only to contralateral temperature differences, but substantial differences in temperature around the wounds themselves. How has the molecular devices impacted your use of antimicrobials? Um, well, uh, I use it as, as not a, a sole device in that decision making. But certainly those uh, patients uh, who will have, uh, say, a fairly high microbial uh, um, autofluorescence pattern uh, as evidenced by uh, either in intense color or less intense color, I am certainly uh, more, more careful and more consistent in measuring temperatures around those areas of uh, the wound. And, um, and also uh, determining whether the pain profile that the patient experiences has changed. Do you feel you could use this on all wound types, i.e. surgical, or is it better for chronic, chronic wounds? Well, I think that um, uh, you probably could use it on uh, acute wounds, although acute wounds uh, you know, tend to, to follow the old Galen dictum of uh, rubor, uh, tumor, uh, calor, and, um, and dolor. Uh, and uh, so uh, in the acute wounds, you tend to see those uh, bedside uh, uh, items that are uh, suggestive of infection. Um, uh, in chronic wounds, though, uh, those uh, clinical bedside parameters are not very useful, and this has been looked at in the literature in the past. So um, uh, I think uh, its use primarily in chronic wounds uh, might be greater, but I, I don't really know the full answer to that uh, question. That's only my personal hypothesis. Could you elaborate on the method of debridement that you used? Do you see a role for it with healthcare professionals who do, who cannot debride in this way? Well, I think that uh, you know sharp debridement has an important role uh, in uh, in wound bed management. And uh, I mean, if I if I uh, recall the various uh, phone calls that I get from community nurses who will tell me that yes, this patient needs debridement. Uh, they need. Uh, their wounds cleaned up and uh, I might say well can you take uh, just the edge of a forceps and, and, and do some preparation uh, in the community setting uh, they may or may not be able to do that but uh, quite often if a, if a nurse is uh, saying that the wounds are looking worse there's more pain uh, there's some odor uh, you know that wound needs to be surgically debrided, it needs to be cleaned. Unfortunately, uh, that uh, service is a limited resource uh, uh, where I am. 
Did you track any cost outcomes? If yes, which ones and what were the outcomes? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, hear that. Did you track any cost outcomes? If yes, which ones and what were the outcomes? Well, no, no. Uh, again, this is just a, a pilot uh, um, a prospective uh, study that we have really just started in, in the last uh, short while. Um, but if I was to, to project uh, costs, I think that those patients who would be stratified to more frequent debridement because of uh, a more uh, intense critical colonization or uh, low-grade infection, um, there are likely cost issues there involved uh, where they might need to be seen more frequently. And that's where the stratification, I think, needs to be studied because not everyone would need frequent debridement, but some do. And, uh, you know, in our limited experience to date, and this is an ongoing uh, observation, uh, is just looking at uh, uh, healing rates and, uh, uh, and fluorescent profiles in those patients who are debrided more often. Since using Moleculate in your practice, do you think you order more or less systemic antibiotics? Um, I, at this point, um, I'm not sure I, I, I have enough information to answer that question. I think what I am is more confident in knowing that uh, a patient who I have put on antibiotics, in fact, does need to be treated. I'm not relying on a, um, you know, a, a culture report that says heavy growth, for instance, uh, as sometimes uh, people respond to or, or doctors respond to when they get an organism in a culture. I do culture those patients who I'm suspicious that they have uh, um, uh, significant uh, peri-wound involvement. Um, but uh, the decision to initiate antibiotics is usually a combination of that profile, um, the presence of temperature, uh, and, uh, and altered pain perceptions. Okay, our next question. It's the bacteria that are below surface of the wound that can often delay healing, even in a healable wound, and sometimes CNS testing doesn't detect this. Does Moleculate measure microbes beyond wound surface, and how deeply are they detected? Well, I wish Moleculite could do everything, but it can't. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, it can measure, uh, from at least my, my uh, understanding of the, um, of the uh, engineers who have uh, uh, worked on this, is that the resolution is probably up to about uh, uh, 1 to 1.5 millimeters below the surface. Um, certainly those patients uh, who are debrided and we are seeing more uh, fluorescence after debridement suggest to me that uh, there may be more uh, microbes below uh, the surface. Now one might say, well, just debride more, but there's a, a limit to debridement that can be done uh, based on, on uh, one's interpretation of the tissue and also what the patient can tolerate. And even if we do uh, use topical anesthetics, which I do, um, one may not be able to go deep enough. So to me, those are the patients who may be at increased risk of developing uh, uh, a, a deeper infection. But I think we need more information to really uh, study those patients and characterize them, uh, and this is part of our uh, ongoing prospective uh, experience. How have you been able to adapt your practice to be able to bring patients back to clinic more frequently and do more frequent debridement? How do I adapt my practice? <clears throat> well, um, uh, the Guelph General Hospital uh, is, is a, a slight peculiarity. It has a community CCAC clinic on, on one side of the lobby and the hospital ambulatory care on the other side of the lobby. 
and uh, the CCAC clinic is uh, much easier to arrange follow-up uh, because I'm not sharing resources. On the other side of the hospital, I share resources. So those who have to be seen there, sometimes requiring a, a bit of begging on my part uh, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, booking clerk. Okay, our next question. Do you use the autofluorescence only to guide debardment, or do you also use it to guide microbial sampling, i.e. swabbing? I actually use it for both, and um, I have certainly gone back after debriding where I thought I had done a good job and uh, uh, just uh, have the, um, the uh, post-debridement picture and gone back to uh, do a little bit more debridement if the patient can tolerate it uh, or if I thought I should have uh, debrided that area. And um, I tend to focus uh, my culturing on those areas that might be persistent in terms of uh, persistent fluorescence uh, for cultures, uh, um, you know, because what I'm looking for primarily are, are streptococcal and staphylococcal organisms, which are the commonest pathogens uh, that uh, tend to uh, produce uh, wound infection uh, in the, uh, the peri-wound. I'm a wound care RN in a family health team, and I see all types of wounds. How useful would this device be to me, in your opinion? Well, I, I think if, if, if you're a wound care practitioner, it probably would be very useful if you uh, use it in a systematic fashion, particularly uh, using it along with temperature measurement uh, and wound sizing and uh, with the, the uh, targeted history about pain. Um, I think it would also be useful that if you had to uh, consult um, either physician or a wound clinic, that these images are objective images and uh, uh, would lend themselves uh, to, um, uh, you know, with the appropriate uh, uh, consents uh, 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 conveyed, um, you know, in, in digital format and recorded and, and evaluated. Uh, so there, there are options here. Uh, sometimes it's a little easier to explain what you're seeing uh, rather than to try and describe uh, the uh, wound in terms of slough and uh, gooey surface and uh, irregular wound, etc., etc. How intuitive is using this device? Well, I figure I, I, I don't uh, uh, I don't consider myself the uh, you know uh, a a hardcore uh, uh, techie, uh, but I found it quite easy to use, and uh, particularly when it gyres with my clinical experience, and I think what I'm seeing here uh, complements my my clinical bedside experience. Was it hard to integrate into your workflow? Uh, it's a challenge because we don't have the um, we don't have the uh, uh, the uh, electronic medical record that allows uh, uh, integration of this and and this is not uh, you know this is not just our hospital even even in hospitals which have uh, uh, electronic medical records do not always have the capacity so uh, what I do is I store these uh, separately um, um, on a on a file that uh, I can use in the clinic. Uh, uh, I'm more interested in the uh, the development of the technology because I think eventually um, you know the appropriate software will be devised that will make this uh, uh, quick and easy to use and uh, and recordable uh, and um, there's no reason why uh, the integration of all of these modalities in terms of uh, temperature and wound measurements uh, could not be integrated into one device. How important is it when moleculate shows no bacteria for you to not debride intact skin and prevent using antibiotics? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first part. Sorry, I'll repeat that. How important is it when moleculate shows no bacteria for you to not debride intact skin and prevent using antibiotics? 
Well, uh, again, I think that one has to go back to the paradigm and remember, uh, moleculite is just simply a tool. It's a tool. It's not. Uh, it's uh, it's a tool to make my life easier. And um, you know, if uh, if for instance I'm not seeing uh, uh, what I think uh, is infection, I need to just make sure that uh, this gyres with my clinical impression. And, and what is actually going on. So far, this has actually been successful. Uh, quite often, though, uh, you know, if a patient is presenting for the first time, uh, one would use uh, the device just to determine, you know, where they would fit uh, on a, uh, uh, in that stratification uh, in terms of, uh, of um, uh, presence of bacteria or lack of presence of bacteria. With regards to printing the results for the record, can a printout be made for the medical record? Uh, at, this, uh, at this point in time, no. That's a work in progress. Uh, but uh, I don't see that uh, this is going to uh, be long in coming. Which derivative method, surgical, autolytic, or enzymatic, is suggested or most effective with the autofluorescence? Um, well, at the moment, I would say the the, uh, the number one would be surgical debridement, um, uh, and then probably followed up with autolytic uh, debridement as that patient uh, uh, is managed in an ongoing way. But that is something that really needs to be looked at. Which bacteria can you see? What can I see? <laughs> well. Uh, I can't see bacteria, but those, um, uh, the fluorescence itself, uh, and uh, again, I'm not, a, I'm not an engineer, but uh, uh, the, the red fluorescence, which I believe is somewhere around, uh, has a wavelength of uh, four or 500 nanometers, uh, as opposed to some of the other light uh, sources, tends to uh, demonstrate uh, organisms like Streptococcus or Staphylococcus. Um, and these are the common ones that actually produce cellulitis. Now, Pseudomonas aeruginosa uh, can uh, be visualized. It, uh, uh, it's, it fluoresces, it's, it's their polyverdins uh, and, uh, poly, uh, and uh, pyocyanins that uh, uh, fluoresce, and that tends to be a blue-green. Um, uh, fluorescence, and that actually may be present uh, in the in the uh, basis of uh, wounds, but uh, numerous, uh, but uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa rarely produces the typical cellulitis in uh, um, in uh, in in diabetic or uh, venous ulcer hosts. Uh, uh, its complications tend to be in, in much more immunocompromised patients and, and usually presents in a different fashion. Do you think your patient's wounds healed faster using the IX? Um, well, I mean, we certainly have had patients uh, who have started to heal, I think only because how we use the technology has made changes in our decision making. So, for instance, uh, if I'm seeing somebody who's got a lot of, uh, of um, um, uh, autofluorescence, I'm more likely to bring them back sooner and reevaluate them uh, to, uh, um, and, and stratify them that way. And I think that uh, this is probably the key. Uh, I think recognizing those who require systemic antibiotics to get them to the next step of uh, wound improvement and debridement and reevaluation with immunofluorescence and the temperature and the size measurement uh, is important. Uh, it's nice to see uh, when all of these technologies are congruent because then you know that you're on the right track. All right, thank you. I'm just going to remind everyone online that they can continue to submit their questions for the next few minutes. If they want to go to the speech bubble icon located in the lower right corner of the web player, they can submit them through there. And if they can take uh, one or two minutes to complete the evaluation polls in the pie chart icon, it would be greatly appreciated. But for now, I'm going to pass it back to Doug. Okay, well, as uh, having the privilege of chair, I had the first question of the session. I'd like to ask another question. 
Um, listening to um, the presentation and also listening to the questions that came in, do you think this technology would have a place in the earlier detection of impending surgical site infections? Uh, I, I think that uh, good monitoring for surgical site infections uh, is obviously uh, important. Uh, I think where there are um, um, more complex wounds which are not healing, it might do. But I have not, uh, I have not used the technology in that setting. Um, but um, I think it, it's certainly worth investigating. Okay, thank you. So on behalf of the Ontario Hospital Association and the CAWC, I would like to thank you, Dr. Landis, for your presentation. And I'd always like to thank you, our audience, um, for your questions. We hope that this webcast has provided you with a sufficient overview of wound bed mapping, demonstrated how microbial autofluorescence can e be easily incorporated into bedside wound evaluation, and provided an objective assessment of wound infections and how the tool can be used um, for clinical decision making in real life. As mentioned by our moderator, I would encourage you to complete the online polling questions. Uh, for more wound care resources, you can go to cawc.net. Uh, to get notifications on wound care programs, notifications of our open access publications, please contact CAWC at info at cawc.net. Um, if you've not had the chance yet, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your